I'm Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. We have a special treat today. We have Stacey Abrams uh, talking with us uh, regarding uh, the new Amazon documentary that uh, debuted last week uh, for AFCA Roundtables. Uh, we're going to get right into this because uh, there are a lot of members on this particular uh, AFCA Roundtable. Starting to my left with Katia Woods out of Philadelphia, Reginald Pounder out of Chicago, Okima Gunn out of Chicago, Rebecca Ford out of Chicago, Aisha Muhammad. Aisha, you know what? I forgot the market. You're Baltimore, right? No, I'm Philly. <laughs> You're Philly too. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Aisha's second time joining us. Rhonda Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, Thomasina Farrar also in Philly. Adriana Gomez Weston. Hey, Adriana, nice to finally meet you. Uh, a new LA resident, my hometown, now living in New San Diego, a San Diego resident, now living in my hometown of Los Angeles. Yes, my first time, so happy. Nice, uh, we're glad to, that you're joining us. And the remarkable KV, KB, who lives in New York, but who is spending her COVID summer in Houston with her family. So without further ado, I'm going to let you guys do what you do so well, and I'll see you on the other side of heaven. Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Abrams. Um, a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I wanted to ask, I was raised in North Philadelphia, so um, a lower income, working class community. There are a lot of people who are disillusioned and they're discouraged uh, with the voting process. I want to ask what motivating piece of advice can you offer to those persons regarding the upcoming election? Well, I, I believe in beginning with the truth. There are legitimate reasons to be disillusioned with the voting process. Uh, part of it is that we have been taught to believe that voting should be a magic pill, that if you show up and vote, things change. And it's just not how government works. It's a process. And if we think about it as a process, if we think about any other muscle memory or any other anything else we want to achieve, we know it takes multiple iterations of trying. It takes a while for things to change. And we know that if we stop, things revert. And so my approach to motivation is less about rah, 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 and more about authentic truth. Voting is a process. It does not solve everything and we don't elect saviors. But we know that when we apply ourselves to it and when we are consistent with it, things actually do improve. Some of these improvements are short term, some of them take a long time, but improvement does come if we are consistent in our effort. But in this moment in particular, we have reached not only the process working, but we've also reached an inflection point in our power. This is the most, we have the single highest concentration of communities of interest that we have ever had at a moment where that matters the most. There are more of us than there have ever been before, and we have more opportunity than we have had in the last decade to actually make this work. Because of the fight against voter suppression, because of the laws that we were able to change in Philadelphia, change in Pennsylvania, but also change in Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, Texas, Florida, in all of those voter suppressing states, we actually have the opportunity for our interest and our efforts to meet the moment. And so I encourage people to vote in this election because our lives are at stake. And because we have the real opportunity to change the outcome if we show up. And the proof point is not past elections, successes or failures, it's the current efforts. The reason they're being so aggressive is that they can count too. And they know if we show up, we win. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm Ms. Abrams, Katya Woods out of Philadelphia as well. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that, um, you know, we talk about every four years is the lack of young people participating in the voting process. You know, we seem to always hone in on subject matters such as um, student loans and, and, and the economy. But how do we engage young people to be lifetime voters? You know, we didn't have social media when we were younger. And, and, and I grew up in a house where we did speak politics at the dinner table. However, uh, how do we 
make the connection that what happens on the other side of the world is not just student loans, it's not just the economy, it's a myriad of things that have an effect that affects their community. How do we get them to buy in? So one of the reasons for All In, the fight for democracy, was a conversation I had with a young person who worked on my campaign. We had unprecedented youth participation. We increased youth participation in the 2018 election by 139%. And that was across all racial spectrums. And this was when we considered youth anyone below the age of 30. One of the ways we were able to engage them was that we actually resourced them. We gave them money and we said, look, come up with an idea. If it's a good idea, we'll fund it. And that helped change the dynamic. But this conversation I was having was with one of our key, like key lieutenants. And we were talking about, this was in 2019, we were having a conversation about what was happening in Florida and the retrenchment by Governor DeSantis against the returning citizens and Amendment 4. And she said, why do they keep calling something a poll tax? There's probably a sexier way to describe it. And I said, what do you mean a sexier way to describe it? She's like, I mean, what is a poll tax anyway? No one knows what that means. We need to come up with a better way to describe what's happening. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. When you and I were growing up, when most of us who were involved in politics were growing up, you were either in the civil rights movement or you're children of the civil rights movement. We have an entire two generations that are removed from what the movement was about and what the lexicon was. And so part of the reason for the, the film is to connect the dots from what began as voter suppression and what we currently has seen manifested, particularly for young people. That voter suppression doesn't just target people of color, it intentionally targets young people. We see this in Texas with the fact that you, Texas and Georgia, Texas where you can use your gun license but not your student ID. Georgia where a state issued student ID is considered invalid for the purposes of voting, but perfectly valid for the purposes of taking your money. In New Hampshire, where they redrew, they, they rewrote the laws because they were afraid too many students were going to vote in the 2020 election. And Florida, where they shut down on-campus polling places, arguing there wasn't enough parking. And so part of the responsibility is that we have to recognize that voting doesn't operate in a vacuum. We have seen a decimation of civic education over the last 20 years because of the push for education to be about rote learning as opposed to internalizing and actually growing your mind. We have seen the adoption by so many of us who understand the civil rights movement. We watched Eyes on the Prize in part because all we had was PBS. They don't have to, so they don't see it. And so we can't see these things in isolation. We have to see them at, of a piece. But then that means also tying what those movements meant to what they are facing today. Because young people, regardless of race, care about the environment. They care about jobs. They care about criminal justice reform. They care about whether they have bodily autonomy. And we have to do the education in, we have to do it in, in hindsight because we've got to explain now that the connective tissue, if you want DA, if you don't want to be charged with a crime and you face six years where someone with the same exact crime faces six months, you got to vote on the district attorneys. If you want to see justice for Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery, then we've got to have judges who actually pay attention. And if you want to be on those grand juries making those decisions, you've got to register to vote. And so part of our responsibility and what I see as one of the goals of All In is that we've got to do the teaching that has unfortunately left so many of these young people out of the conversation. So it's not just about the issues or the process, it's connecting the dots and being intentional about it. Because when we are intentional, we actually do see dramatic increases in participation. And I would just say, go look at the streets where protests are happening. If we do more than simply say, just go vote. If we say protest in the streets and then protest at the ballot boxes and connect those dots, we will continue to see a rise in youth, in youth participation in our elections. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Th yeah, thank you for all you're doing. I really appreciate the fact that I'm Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago. I really appreciate the fact that you're doing the work that, that you're doing. I'm particularly uh, interested in the number of young black men voting. Uh, that's of, of real interest to me because when I talk to, to them, 
they there is a despair about what does that mean for me does does my life uh really change what i think the the film does well is that it goes through all of these things that try to block folks from from voting and it made me think that if it's that valuable to block people from doing it then it must be that valuable for people to do it so from a plan standpoint, what, what would be the plan to make sure from, because uh, I'm interested in, in black, young black men, uh, seeing this, understanding this, uh, grasping this, and be, being more part of the movement? You can't fight an enemy you don't know and you don't understand. And for young black men in particular, again, as with young people, there's an intersection of challenges that we often elide, and then we're surprised when people don't get it. Mass incarceration, what, what happened in 1868 in Florida with the disenfranchisement of, of basically black men, which continued through the Mississippi plan in all of those states that adopted those felony disenfranchisement laws. When you layer that with mass incarceration that also disproportionately targeted young people of color, black men of color, and then you layer on top of that the set of impediments for re-emerging into society, whether you are caught in that or not, you are affected by it. Because there are very few young black men who don't know someone who has this impediment. And voting is, a, I mean, to, to Katya's point, voting is a communal thing. If you grow up in a community that votes, if you talk about politics, you learn to make that your ethic. But if you grow up in a community about, that is centered around disenfranchisement, centered around disadvantage, centered around marginalization, then you're gonna be deeply suspicious legitimately of anyone who tells you it's not so. You're going to believe the evidence of your eyes. And so the reason for the film is to say, your eyes aren't tricking you, but let me tell you what you're seeing. And that's part of the reason for showing that arc of history. But the other thing we wanted to show were different iterations of what it means to have this power. That it's not just about every young black man being on paper. It is about the fact that entire communities are disenfranchised, and that's one facet of it. But let's talk about what can be done if you get on the other side. Desmond Mead's story is not just about a returning citizen getting the right to vote. It's about someone who came out of prison who forced the state of Florida to change its ways. And that kind of redemptive story, I think, is critical. But we also have to think about the, the real politic of young Black men who face disproportionate likelihood of undereducation, over-incarceration, and underemployment. We have to be very intentional about talking about what these things are and what the solutions are. It is not enough to say, go vote, if you don't explain who's in charge of making the choices and what those choices should look like. And so in my world, it's a triad of responsibilities. Protest in the streets, protest at the ballot box, and protest in the halls of power. If you skip any of those steps, they will skip over you and they will not deliver what you deserve. And so what Amazon has done, and I'm very proud of the work that Liz Garvis and Lisa Cortez did in filmmaking, but I'm also deeply proud of being a producer and being in partnership with Amazon because they've actually built out an entire program. Just this week, I was on a call with uh, the American Federation of Teachers because they've built an entire curriculum. They're building a curriculum around All In for Voting. I've had a lot of young, a lot of college professors reach out to me. They are teaching this. But we have to get to communities that aren't embedded in the academy. And so part of it is making sure that we're pushing this film out in every medium. We're working with NAACP and other groups, uh, community change, uh, color of change. So we've got a broad network of organizations who have as their uh, very clear focus reaching these marginalized communities that legitimately despair, but really helping them understand what the enemy looks like with voter suppression so that they understand what change can look like if they engage. Thank you so much. I was excited seeing the movie. Now I'm excited hearing the plan. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Well, go to allinforvoting.com. You can see all of the resources that we have, including resources for returning citizens, for young people, for military. We want people to understand that this is not about a moment. I hate the phrase, it's not a moment, it's a movement, but this is not about the moment. This really is about how we create a transformational understanding of the power of voting, because fundamentally, this is a power grab. If you cannot win through the power of your ideas, they intend to win through the power of suppression. And we can only win if we use our power to overwhelm theirs.
Hi, nice to meet you, Miss Abrams. I was so impressed by um, the movie. Um, I was really taken aback and really shocked by what was going on. And I was surprised at how unaware I was of what was happening in regards to voter suppression. Um, I noticed that you said in the movie when you did your speech that it wasn't a concession speech, that um, you wanted to bring awareness and maybe that what happened to you that day was to bring awareness to people about voter suppression in black and brown communities. Going forward, how do you feel that we can reach like the masses, like you said, in regards to, you know, putting it out there that this is happening because I was totally unaware of it. So I had the option on that day to either challenge the electoral outcome to see if I could make myself governor or I could challenge the system itself. I'm the daughter of folks who are civil rights activists as teenagers who raised me to understand the scope of the system, but they also raised me to understand that this can't be about a single person because the minute it becomes about a person, or in my case about a politician, then you give people the permission to abdicate their responsibility because then it's just about one person trying to get a job. My obligation was to leverage that moment to have the larger conversation about a system that is broken. And when you focus attention on a system, you give people permission to be angry and to be engaged, but then you have to explain what the system is. And, and you should not feel shocked that you don't know it. Part of the nefarious nature of 21st century voter suppression is how obscure it is, how pernicious it is because it looks like user error. It looks like people making mistakes. And because we don't talk about it, people don't go home and say, well, look at what I did wrong. That's not what we do. And so for the last 20 years, people have been facing voter suppression, but they usually presumed it was their fault. Well, I should have had this ID. I should have known when I was born 70 years ago in segregation that I should have demanded an original birth certificate because in 20, you know, in 70 years, they're going to make me show it so I can have the right to vote in Wisconsin even though Jim Crow said I legally couldn't have it. I'm a Native American who lives on a reservation where the state has to, the power to either grant me or deny me a residential address, but they're gonna make a law saying I have to have a residential address in order to vote out the people who require that I have a residential address. So it's designed to be a trap. And part of the goal of the film, part of the goal of my speech, part of my mission is that we have very few moments of virality. And I didn't necessarily know I was going to have a viral moment, but I know a lot of people were paying attention to my campaign. And I had that moment. My responsibility was to leverage that moment, but it was also my responsibility to give voice to a system of oppression that could be defeated if we knew it was there. So that's a very lofty way of saying this. I wrote a book about it. Our time is now power, purpose, and the fight for fair America. I've done podcasts with just about everyone. I've done podcasts with you know, one of the stars of Doctor Who. I've done podcasts with reporters. I've done podcasts with Buffy the Vampire Slayer lovers. I, go, I will talk to anybody because we have to meet people. I've, I've done Instagram lives with folks that my nieces and nephews now think I'm important because they saw me with them. And we did this film. We cannot break a system until we explain what the system is. And my responsibility as I see it is to use the platform and, in my case, my loss to demonstrate how we can all have gain. But we can't just have these conversations in conference rooms or in political rallies. We've got to get it to the people who are actually being oppressed. And if we don't call it what it is, they're going to continue to think either the system is designed never to be for their success or they're going to believe that this is such a permanent evil. Why bother trying? Well, I appreciate, you know, the informity. Thank you for informing us with this movie and have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you. Hi, Stacey. Um, I'm uh, Okima Gunn with uh, the Chicago Defender. Hello. How you doing? Um, thank you for, um, thank you for doing this documentary uh, about voter suppression. I think that it's um, an issue that um, is relevant, but it will always be relevant just because of the history of um, 
not only African Americans, but just voter suppression in general. Um, there's a lot of things I learned in this documentary, uh, especially about, you know, the voter suppression with Native Americans and college students and people in, um, in areas that are not able to vote because of, you know, the, the polls being taken away. Um, but um, I, my question is, um, when you voted um, for your, when, when you voted in your election, um, when you went to the polling place and I know you had cameras following you and then you went to go register, um, there was, the uh, your status was absentee. Was it an absentee ballot? Or there was some kind of confusion. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to know was, what were you thinking at that exact time and how did that motivate you to move forward and to let other people know about um, different types of ways that they can pursue um, their voting rights? So I've been focused on voting rights since I was 17. I set up a, a table at Manly Plaza at Spelman College mm -hmm. and it was roundly ignored by all of my classmates from Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, and Morris Brown. None of them cared, none of them registered. But I always believed in voting rights and for most of my time, it's been about the expansion of voting rights. Right. We had the right to vote, let's make sure more people use it. But as of 20, you know, 2013, really, it became a fight for voter protection because right. of the attempted retrenchment away from people even being able to exercise that most basic and fundamental right. So when I went to go and vote, I, I was, I wouldn't say uniquely, but I was certainly more prepared than most voters. But I didn't vote absentee. I'd never voted absentee because I like going to the polls. Right. I was excited when I voted for the first time in 1992 and got to go to the polling place, had to take a bus to get there, but I got to go and vote. And I believed in casting my ballot on election day, but because we knew in 2018 of the ongoing voter suppression, we made the decision as a team that I would vote early. And so that's why this was such a big deal. I was trying to prove to others that you should trust the system by going to vote early. So we had all of those cameras following us from all around the country, all around the world. I get up to that table and a very nice young woman in a, just in a uh, polling place that was very predisposed to like me and want to be helpful, she still had the responsibility to lean forward in a very shaky whisper, tell me that I had already voted absentee. And I'm like, I have never, I have been voting in Georgia since 1992. I have never requested an absentee ballot in my life. And she was staring at that screen and looking at those cameras. And my options were to be angry or to engage her because this is a young woman who had a line going out the door at South DeKalb Mall. It had wrapped around three times in the main mall area. So I was one more person trying to cast a ballot but all the black people in there were looking at me and they were looking at the cameras. And so she wanted to be helpful. She didn't have the power to fix it because that's mm. the first point of, pro of the problem. So mm. few people on the local level have the ability to solve the problem at the election site because of the nefarious, and the nefarious nature and the incompetence at the state level. And so I encouraged her to go and find her manager, the one person I knew could likely help resolve this issue. And that person came and she was older, more seasoned. Also, I was familiar. She could also tell what was happening. And, and we had a whispered conversation. I'm like, I don't want to make a big deal about this. I do need it to get fixed. And when we finally got it resolved, when I did my post voting press conference, I didn't say I had a problem in part because at that moment, I needed people to be able to trust the system and to try the system. Mm -hmm. I had the independent capacity to push for what I needed. But one of the challenges with talking about voter suppression is that you don't want to talk about it in a way that it dissuades others from trying their luck. Right. And so my obligation was to fix it for myself, but then to make sure we notified all of our allies to say, this is something that's happening. Make sure you're, you're aware of it. Make sure all the lawyers we had on call were ready for it. And of course it became a massive issue because across the state people were told they'd voted. There was a young white man in the film who had the same experience. And even Brian Kemp, the you know, architect of, of, the, of the voter suppression, he for a moment couldn't vote either. And so all of this is to say, 
there's a power in education. There's a power in knowledge. There's certainly a power in having, you know, visibility. And part of what we want to accomplish through the work I do, what I have taken on for my responsibility in this is to give voice to those who face those challenges so they know it's not you. It is not a bug in the system. It is a feature of the system for you to doubt your right to vote. So my job is to say it happens to the best of us. It happens to the least of us. It happens to the brownest of us. It happens to the whitest of us. All of us can face it because when you break the machinery of democracy, you break it for everyone. Even the people who are the most prepared, even the person who helped write one of the laws. Well, thank you for answering that question. I know it was a lengthy answer, um, but um, I, we really appreciate you making the film and being a staunch um, champion for uh, voter suppression. Thank you. Hi, Mrs. Abram. Uh, this is KB. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Um, I thought the documentary was great. Um, and all too timely, obviously, especially right now uh, with the upcoming presidential election. Um, so when we win with the new administration, because, you know, I'm going to speak positively, despite all of the challenges that we are up against, um, what changes around the voting process do you feel like um, we can make immediately in order to rectify and permanently dismantle voter suppression? First of all, we need to have a federal election law that actually lays out the critical predicates, automatic voter registration. The United States is one of the one of few industrialized, democratized nations that require citizens to register themselves. Everywhere else, they understand it's a fundamental government obligation and you're automatically registered. Same day registration. When you move, it should not disenfranchise you and you shouldn't have to plan your life around whether or not you move to your new place in time to get back on the rolls. Um, we also need to make certain that polling plate, so it's, that polling places are available, that they have, to, they have to be adequately resourced. We have to ensure that, uh, red, no, that restrictive voter IDs are no longer permitted, that they have to be reasonable in their scope. We have never not had voter ID in the United States. What has happened in the last 20 years is that they've become more and more restrictive to force people out of the process. And we need to ensure that we have a voting rights restoration, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, because a federal law that fixes the big things, that allows for vote by mail in every state, that regularizes all of the rules, it doesn't allow there to be a ceiling on how easily you make it, but we set a floor on how hard you can make it. That's critical, but that only solves the federal issue. We also have to have a Voting Rights Act so that states don't exempt themselves by making it harder on the local level because the Constitution, until we change it, gives to the states the authority to actually administer elections. For example, even if we pass every one of those things, unless there is a federal law that says that, ex -felon, that, that returning citizens have the right to vote as a matter of federal law, then states will always be able to restrict it. And so we have to have federal law, but we also have, have state law that oversees and never permits what happened with the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act to happen again, which is a retrenchment towards disenfranchisement and disallowing access for eligible citizens. If we do those things, if we do those in the first 100 days, it solves a lot of our future problems because the point of entry to power in the United States is the registration of the right to vote. And then the way we make that power real is our constancy with voting. I liken it to chemotherapy. We have the cancer of racism, the cancer of systemic inequity. We have the cancer of you just a lack of humanity. And you cannot cure cancer with a single act. It takes chemotherapy. You've got to keep going back and going back. And sometimes the cure feels harder than the disease, but we would never say, never mind. We would constantly apply that treatment because we know that the cure is necessary. And that is how we cure voter suppression by applying the strictest of protocols and keeping at it so that it can never recur, that we're constantly in remission. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right, well, finally unmuted. Um, 
My name is Rebecca Ford, and I'm in Chicago. I write for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin and um, am on WCPT, which is Chicago Progressive Talk Radio. And so a couple things. One is I am very close friends with Victor Haley, who takes credit for your going to Sutherland Asheville. So I just <laughs> wanted to sort of like <laughs> say that aloud. So oh, he sent me to West Virginia during my summer, so he just needs to keep that in mind too, but yes. Okay, so I, I'm looking forward to going back and telling him that I mentioned that to you. Um, you and then, uh, I was gonna say, you know, on this, for the African American Film Critics Association, we have people all over the country and they're, you know, sort of reaching to people with really diverse interests. So, what would you say are the three things that you would say to us to look, you know, when you're talking to your people, say one, say two, and say three. What are like three bullet point takeaways that you want us to bring back to our communities just to get through everybody's head? One, voter suppression is real, but it can be defeated. Even in my election, despite the fact that I'm not the governor, they had to work for it. The man was running the election and still barely eked out a 1.4% victory. And that's before we were talking about it. But now that we're talking about, now that we have named it, it can be defeated. Number two, don't panic. This is 2020. I'm, I'm waiting for their, them to discover a volcano in downtown Atlanta or something. I mean, it's just crazy. And so what we have to be situated in is this reality that we're going to keep getting bad news, but we can't let that bad news distract us from the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are we get to choose who's going to lead us out of this pandemic, out of this racial reckoning, out of these challenges, and that that selection happens in this election season. So whether it's about the post office or about murder hornets, do not panic. Do not let the President of the United States distract us with the incendiary things he says for exactly that reason. He knows it's crazy, but he knows if we're focusing on him, we're not focusing on us. So one, we can win. Two, don't panic. And three, by God, make a plan and make it early. Voting is complicated. It is the intention of those who do not want us to be heard to make it so complicated, we just give up. But if we know it's complicated, if we make a plan to vote, then when obstacles get in our way, we have a backup plan and a backup to the backup plan. On June 9th, when we had the meltdown in Georgia, I had tried to vote by mail. I know the law. I know the rules. I, got, I applied for my absentee ballot. It arrived. I filled it out front and back. The envelope was sealed shut. And under Georgia law, if I had slid it open, put my mail in there and taped it shut, it would have been thrown out because it, I would have been in violation of tampering with the ballot. But I had a backup plan. My backup plan was I was going to vote early in person down the street, but the day that was supposed to happen, Donald Trump did something to the census and I couldn't, but I had a backup to my backup plan. So I knew I had to vote in person on election day. But each time I ran into an obstacle because I knew the rules, because I'd made a plan for myself, I was able to adapt. And that's what we have to think about. This is an election season where we have to adapt to everything they're going to throw at us. It's like the last 30 minutes of a Marvel movie. All hell's gonna break loose and they're going to do everything in their power to stop us. We have to be so focused on the bottom line that we don't get distracted, that we believe we can beat our enemy and we've got a plan to get it done. Well, thank you. I have one, this raises just one more question for me. So when people go to the polls and they find out that, you know, their signature doesn't match, that they uh, are told that they've already voted, that they're absentee or whatever, what do you do? So deer in the headlights, what do you do? So, that, so that's why it's make a plan and make a plan to vote early. Because you, what you want is to use every tool in your toolbox. Go to allinforvoting.com. So please make sure this is a part of it. Allinforvoting.com, you can find out all of the rules where you live and you can find out your status. So if you go to allinforvoting.com, if you have the right to vote by mail, vote by mail first, because they will let you know as soon as you get, go through the process, they'll tell you whether it worked or not. If it worked, you're good. If it didn't work, 
you can decide, do I fix my ballot? Because in most states, they have to let you cure it, meaning fix it. Or you can decide it's just going to be easier for me to show up and vote in person early. But because you started the process early enough, you got time to go in person. And if you can't go in person that day, if you meant to go in person early and then you missed the deadline, election day is last call. But because you made a plan, because you started early, you can meet all of the obstacles they put in your way because you've given yourself enough time to fix whatever is broken or to get help. And so allinforvoting.com gives you all the information. But if you need a lawyer, call 866-OUR-VOTE. 866-OUR-VOTE. Because that is the set of lawyers across the country whose job it is is to help you figure out if it's you or them and it's probably them, so call us. Thank you. Hey, it's Rhonda. I'm in Atlanta and I can tell you voter suppression is real because in Midtown, when I went to vote, they had changed the polling place and I had to go. And so three days later, I got a letter saying that my polling place had been changed. So I put it on Instagram and I reported it. And as you know, today in Georgia, Trump is here. Yes. But, but um, my question in the documentary I saw that you shared the stage with Coretta Scott King, and I wanted you to speak on that moment and also to talk about what she's meant to this movement. So I was 19 and I'd been very involved in the labor movement in Georgia. I'd done some organizing at Food Lion. I was registering voters. Um, I had been doing a lot of work around youth civic engagement and youth poverty issues. And so I'd been picked as one of the youth speakers at the 30th anniversary on the March on Washington. It was an extraordinary thing. Uh, Coretta Scott King was one of the keynote speakers and I didn't, she, she spoke because she was so kind and gracious. She spoke generally to all of us, but you know, being in that space where she spoke not simply as the widow of Dr. King, but spoke as an architect of our response to so many of our challenges as a strategist who in her own right has helped build the civil rights movement. Um, I think she is emblematic of how black women have long been the chief strategist and the engines of change, but often are in the shadows because we know the work has to be done no matter what. But the grace with which she assume the mantle of power while still giving everyone around her the space to see themselves in charge. Uh, but you never doubted that she was the center of attention when you were in a room with her is something extraordinary. But what was even more important to me is that she never relinquished her belief that more was possible, especially for the marginalized and the disadvantaged. And she organized her life, not simply as a testament to what had come before, but as a project to make it real for everyone. Well, thank you. Absolutely. I think Adriana, you're the last one. <laughs> um, hey, Ms. Abrams, it's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for your documentary. Um, for me, it was a bit, like I wouldn't say depressing, but sobering, but I like that it ends on a, a message of hope. So my question for you is like dealing with people who are like apolitical or on, still on the fence about voting, like how, what are some ways you can help encourage them or maybe point them in the right direction? Because this is one of the most, possibly most crucial election in years, possibly ever. So how can we influence people that maybe think their vote doesn't matter or that they, they, it's not gonna help either way? I, I think that goes back to the, the first answer and in a different way, but we've got to tell the truth about what voting is and what voting is not. And the challenge often is that we're so in a hurry to win an election, we forget about building an electorate. We forget about actually building the rationale for voting because when you tell someone to do something because it matters right now, either they're gonna be moved by the urgency or if you've ever dealt with a three-year-old, they're gonna sit down and not move at all because, well, I don't care about your timetable, I'm gonna follow my own we have to recognize that this is not just about a single election. I mean, this election is critical and crucial and vital, and it is an existential threat to our future, but it's also one election. And so our conversations have to be about 
how we build on this election to build real power long term. And for those who are disillusioned, for those who have decided it doesn't matter, our obligation is to take it out of the sky and bring it down to their lives. It is to talk about who makes the decisions. And so I, here's what we did in our campaign. Before a single person talked about me, we sent out hundreds of canvassers to talk about what the governor does. Because nobody cares about who they're picking if they don't know what the job is. And part of our opportunity to engage those who are disengaged is to, instead of starting by saying, here's what I need you to do for me, ask the question, what do you need? How can, you, how can we help? Because if people believe that there is something in it for them, they are willing to overcome their disbelief and try. But if it seems like this ethereal notion, you're doing it for the ancestors, you're doing it because you're told to, you're doing it because you just want people to shut up, you might agree in that moment, but you're never gonna actually follow through. But if it begins with how can we help, what is the challenge you face? It's why I'm fighting so hard for the census. The census seems like one of those things nobody cares about, but it's going to determine the next 10 years of our lives. And the Trump administration is doing its level best to lie about who's here. But I don't tell people to fill out the census because it is an important statistical analysis. I say fill out the census because if you have a cell phone or utility bill, they already know how to find you. You only get your money and your political power if you fill out the census. And when I say your money, I mean when they release those COVID checks and they decide how many people need to get them, if you are not counted, you will not be in the number. And so it's taking these big pieces and these large esoteric arguments and concretizing them so that the people whose lives will be affected if they don't vote, understand that it's not about this macro issue, it is about this micro success that they can have. And the most fundamental way to say it is you are either at the table or you are on the menu. You may not believe in politics, but politics believes in you. And they will either use that power to help you or they will use it to hurt you. And if you are tired of being hurt by it, why not try the opposition? Why not try the, try the other way? Ms. Abrams, on behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your leadership. Uh, we thank you for your efforts. All in the Fight for Democracy is airing now on Amazon Prime. We invite you to watch it and to be involved in the process. Vote on November 3rd. Vote on November 3rd. Chorus, vote on November 3rd. Say it again. Vote on November 3rd. Vote on November 3rd. Be part of the solution. Be part of the answer. Thank you so much, Ms. Abrams. Thank you all for having me, and thank you for the incredible work you do. Let's go watch a movie. Absolutely. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you.